there's nothing that could be less traditional than this belief, this, this modernist belief that private revelation is optional, especially when it's directed at you. Our Lord is the Lord of history, and he doesn't, he doesn't send our mother, his mother just randomly. So that's why we have to take these seriously. Hey, my friends, I'm sure you've heard about private revelations. Uh, what we always hear, uh, you know, around is that, you know, all those revelations, Fatima and Lourdes and uh, La Salette and Rudabach and all these revelations from heaven, Our Lady came down from heaven, apparently you don't have to really believe them. And, uh, you know, therefore, if you don't believe them, you don't really have to do what they say to do. You know, they say you have to do the first Saturday devotion. But, meh, if you're not called to believe it, really, to be a Catholic, then do you really need to? There's going to be a super surprising answer for you to that question. Stay tuned to this episode of The John Henry Weston Show. Gene Zanetti and Father Francesco Giordano, so good to be with you both. Hello, thank, thank you for you. having us. Let's begin, as you always do, with the sign of the cross. Father, if you wouldn't mind leading us. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, first of all, if um, you can tell us just a little bit about who you are, just so that we know as we're getting into this topic. Father, well, we'll start with you. Yes, I'm Father Francesco Giordano. I'm in Rome, and uh, I'm the Director for Human Life International in the Rome office. And I also teach at various different universities in Rome uh, in dogmatic theology and moral theology. Yeah, with a background Beautiful. in Thomistic theology. Yeah. Thank you, Father. And Gene, what's your background? Yes, I'm Gene Zanetti. I have an apostolate spiritual strength, building athletes for Christ. My business is Winning Mindset, a sports psychology company. My master's degrees are exercise science, sports psychology, and school psychology. And most importantly, I'm a Catholic and husband and father of three. All right. So this is very interesting because this notion of, you know, private revelation is private. We don't have to believe it. But that brings up some really weird questions because then the rosary itself is from mm -hmm. a private revelation. St. Dominic, is it not? Gene, why don't mm -hmm. you give us yeah. that first? Yeah, there's, there's nothing that could be less traditional than this belief, this, this modernist belief that private revelation is optional, especially when it's directed at you. Whenever heaven speaks, heaven has a very clear purpose and when heaven wants us to do something, we must comply. And that's pretty basic when you think about it. You could ask that of an, an eight-year-old who made their first Holy Communion. And unfortunately, we've been given a lot of false information. I mean, if you go up to 99% of Catholics, and I'm including priests too, they'll tell you private revelation is optional. And when you look at what the, what the church has said, what the manualists have said, and even what ecumenical councils have said in the past, nothing could be less traditional. Boy, that's some... Pretty strong stuff there. Father, do you concur with that? Is it really we're like, you know, these private revelations where we sort of need to believe them? Well, first, I think we need to define what we mean. So I think by universal revelations, we mean the deposit of the faith. So that's must be believed. Uh, and then private revelations, essentially, that are approved by the church, those are there to help us believe what is the deposit of faith. So that's sort of, I think, the important distinction. Um, because we believe, as Catholics, that uh, obviously that what our Lord said in Matthew 28, that he would not abandon us and that he would be there to, with us to the end of time, or what, what we read in the John 9 text, that there is much more to be to be said than can be held in these books. We, we are not a religion of the book. That's important to keep that in mind. So yes, we do have a canonic, a, a group of canonical texts that, by the way, were only uh, officially universally said as such at Trent. Yes, we had particular councils like 397 in Carthage. Um, those in in the early in that that's the late fourth century with Saint Augustine and all that we that we started talking about canonical text, the canonicity of scripture, but it was not until Trent that that was actually made clear. So you would get up to like 1500 years that we've got this, you know, we've got, we don't even have it clear to find what are canonical texts except for by a particular council. Um, 
so that shows us that you know there's a, there's a lot of elasticity in all of this. However, we are after Trent here, so we have the canonical text in Scripture. And what is there to say for everything after or outside of those texts? Well, that's the Holy Spirit speaking uh, and speaking to us in, in through his saints, through mystical appearances, through mystical uh, phenomena, as we see like people like saints like St. Saint Catherine of Siena, who, you know, with all of the power of God in her, brought the Pope back to Rome from Avignon. So uh, that there is such powerful divine intervention by also by means, by human means, is something very much part and parcel to the history of the church. Um, so on that note, I have to say, you know, when you have a private revelation that is approved by the church, that is legitimately approved by the church, such as what you mentioned, Rudebach in 1831, La Salette 1846, or uh, Lourdes 1858, Fatima 1917, when you have such how let's say they're not public revelation in the sense they're private revelations that are made public for all of us well then i think we must pay attention our lady doesn't just appear out of the blue for no reason let me give a historical context to this so what is interesting about the three apparitions in france is that you've got uh you've got a post french revolution period you've got uh August Comte in 1822 writing a new religion, positivism. It's a new science, a new religion of scientism. And, uh, you know, there's, I'm reading right now a great book by um, Michael Auger on, it's called The Immortal in You. And it talks about our soul, because we're living in a society right now where science, natural science claims that there's no soul anymore. We have just recently lived, you know, through um, the whole COVID situation where science was the last word, science, 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 natural science. But science, as we know, the word scientist itself appears in 1847 in English language, but science was there all throughout the past in philosophy. We can't say that Aristotle was not a scientist. So what do we mean by science? We mean knowledge. Do we mean that knowledge needs to be limited just to the mere natural, to the positivism of August Comte? I think not. And that's what happens with Our Lady's interventions in history in 1831 in Rudebach, where uh, she brings the miraculous medal to bear, the importance of the, mirror, the, of the miraculous. There's something more to life than just what you see, what you touch. There is a metaphysical, you know, I'm reading another book right now also on, uh, by Dietrich von Hildebrand called The New Tower of Babel. I mean, we live in a society that doesn't believe in the metaphysical anymore. We live, we have to remember that prior to the French Revolution, you had uh, Kant in uh, 1782 writing on the, on the critique of reason. You know, you, you have, you have, it's all rationalism. It's all nominalism. It's all a form of very superficial knowledge, essentially. And what we are preaching is a knowledge that's metaphysical, that's deep, that looks at reality in the depths. And that's what you have with the back. You have these miraculous metal. You have you have a touch of, of heaven. 1846, La Salette. Why? Why? Why does she emphasize so much, Our Lady, in that point, uh, the Sabbath? Well, because we're living in a, an industrial society where every day is the same. Well, our Lord, our Lord has always said, no, there needs to be a, a time of rest. A time of, of of meditation and contemplation on, on on the Lord, on the Lord of Lords, the Lord who made time, who made space, and uh, and so and a recall to the basic act, to the basic commandments, the third commandments, right? Um, as you see, it's emphasizing what has already been publicly revealed. And uh, 1858, Our Lady of Lords, when it, that's interesting, that year is interesting. 1854, we had uh, declared the Immaculate Conception dogmatically. 1858, she says she's the Immaculate Conception. And it's happening when? The year before uh, The Origin of Species by Darwin. You know, it's it, what, what is it about? It's about recreation, which is similar to the Sabbath. What is the Sabbath? What is respite about? It's not just resting and taking a vacation. It's about when you have recreation in uh, in religious life. It's about recreating the day and discussing the day that you've had, the time, the solace you've had in prayer with God. You come together as a community and you talk about it. So it's it's a rest that is meditating upon how God has worked in your life. 
And that's why we need the Sabbath. And, and that's why we need to rethink about our origins. Because if you don't know the origins, you don't know the end. And we live in a society also, philosophically speaking, that has, you know, we, we don't have the final cause. We have, we, we, we look at efficient causality. We look at material causality. We've lost touch of final causality and formal causality. We've lost touch with where we're where we're from and where we're going, and we've lost touch with the with the soul, with the formal cause. So, in light of all that, looking at that in a historical context, why are ladies appearing at all this? And then the emphasis of the church in the 1850s and 1870s with with the first Vatican Council, and in the Roman school with Perone and others, other great scholars in Rome, Jesuit scholars who were discussing this. Uh, the importance of divine revelation, because you can't, we can't have a, a life that's based just on mere positivism. The, the, there has to be the supernatural. So the debates actually for about a hundred years until the until you, in the 1950s, we have the debate on what is what is the nature of the supernatural, and its intervention in our lives. And with that, you have 1917. You have this great, you have this, the great apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima, talk, calling us to do what. Penance and reparation, prayer and reparation and penance. That's what the message is about, really, fundamentally, and pushing for that. Or else, it, or else there would be there would be uh, many uh, many uh, many punishments, divine punishments scourged upon us. Um, but the emphasis on the on the penance and the prayer, and, and we look around us, we look at a society that has really forgotten to pray and to do penance and you see those messages they're all connected it's like it's an it's a, it's a it's a if you look at the narrative of the message and you look at the reason for the message and you look at it in light of what the church is reflecting upon theologically it all just simply makes sense so in light of everything i've just said these messages are there to enrich in our faith, our tradition, to enrich in our imagination, to enrich in our our religious sense, uh, to to encourage us, to 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 bring to to encourage the the will within us to desire God again, and and for me that's what these messages do. They don't they don't contradict my faith. I mean, what to pray more, to to read, to pray more the Rosary, to pray the Rosary, the five the five first Saturdays of. The, or the or the nine first Fridays, uh, you know. I, I don't see what the problem with that is. I mean, that's back to back to um, also our Lord. I'm when I think of another apparition in in the 60, 1680 uh, with our with our Lord and the Sacred Heart appearing uh, in uh, to our, to say Margaret Mary Ella Cook. When was that? Eight years before the glorious revolution in England that eliminated catholicism these our lord and our lady do not appear in just randomly they are let us not forget our lord is the lord of history and he doesn't he doesn't send our mother his mother uh, and our mother just randomly so that's why we have to take these seriously and if the church has approved them then uh it's not something you can just say well i'm, I'm not going to believe it if you don't you're basically i think you're you're really um uh, you, I think you can say you have a bit of a dry faith. And I, I guess maybe I'm a little bit too Italian and I like to have a little bit more imagination in my faith. So, Indeed. Thank you, Father. Uh, so, Gene, yes. you were saying that it is one of the greatest or, or most severe marks of what's going on today in, in modern church history, this rejection of uh, the necessity of believing and holding to what's coming from heaven. Give us more of that. Right, because we know that our Lord and Our Lady have said in the apparitions of Fatima that only she can save us. This is our only hope. And that if we do, if enough people, an unknown critical number, God always uses a faithful remnant, a relatively small number of people who must execute his will, doing exactly what he says to merit a blessing for the entire world. And since this is the answer for our time, we know this is something that, that, ha that has to be done. Our Lord and Our Lady said only she can save us. So all of the problems of the world, everything, the crisis in the world, the crisis in the church, it's all symptomatic of us not living the Fatima message. That's why it's so devastating. So what really hit me like a slap in the face, I remember reading the CDF document on the message of Fatima in 2000 by Cardinal Ratzinger, where, he's, where he basically says that, um, I mean, I have the quote here, he says that um, it's basically pr uh, private revelation can only be accepted with 
Catholic faith, with human faith and never Catholic faith. All right. So human faith, if we hear private revelation, we have to accept it on human faith and it's prudent to act. So it's good to do. We don't have to do it. Right. And that always struck me as kind of odd. Why would God intervene in history? Even when you look back in the Bible, the Jews had 613 commandments to fulfill. But sometimes God would intervene in history and says, do something on top of the 613 commandments. And if those few people don't do it, there's a massive punishment. So I knew this couldn't be optional. How could this only be human faith? And then one of the things I was doing is reading my spiritual theology ma uh, manual fa by Father Jordan Allman, spiritual theology. Father Ripperger talks about this a lot. And then I read back also my other theological manual by Father Antonio Marin, which is 1954, The Theology of Christian Perfection. And they both give the same quote. They said, if a private revelation contains a message for others and it has been accepted as an authentic revelation, those persons have an obligation to accept the truth of the revelation and act upon it. And then when you read the other manuals, they're saying the same thing. So when it's directed at you. So I went back to the source document that Cardinal Ratzinger quoted in that CDF document. And indeed, it does say when private revelation is not directed at you, it's only human faith. And it can never be understood with Catholic faith. But if you look in that in that document, I don't, I don't know if you could see the book through my blurred screen, screen Heroic Virtue, Volume 3. If you look at the paragraph directly above where Cardinal Ratzinger quotes, it actually speaks to more accurately to Fatima. What is to be said of those revelations that are directed of you? And it says to he to whom the private revelation is proposed and announced ought to believe and obey the command or message of God. He is bound to believe God. So we can't mix the categories. There's a big difference if the private revelation is directed at us, which is almost never. <laughs> and then there, and then when it's not directed at us. So as an example, when Our Lady says to wear the miraculous medal, uh, this is uh, at Rue de Bac. Yes, it's prudent for us to do that. We accept that at human faith. We're not obligated to do it. The people who Our Lady directs that message at, at do need to do it. But when Our Lady of Fatima says, I'll perform a miracle so that all may believe, this is a message for everyone. So that's how we know. And Pope John Paul II said this, that Fatima imposes a commitment on the church. Pope Benedict XVI said the same thing. So we have to take this serious. And it's not just merely a matter of human faith. It can't be Catholic faith because it's not the deposit of faith. But there is a different area, divine faith when it's just specifically an approved private revelation and it's directed at you. And again, that almost never happens. It's so rare, but when it does happen, you have to take heed. And the Fifth Lateran Council says the same. So, Father, tell us, if, this is going to get somewhat confusing because there's an issue of private revelation that has been approved, those that aren't approved, because you got into it a little bit, but there's more of a question because... While Fatima was going on, while the miracles were happening, while uh, Our Lady of Lourdes was appearing, the miracles were happening, it wasn't approved. Yet people went there, were healed there. A lot of people suggest, oh, if you go to something that's not approved or you listen to it or whatever, you're sinning or it's dangerous. H how do we suss that out? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you cited it well. I, I remember in Lourdes, uh, King... Uh, King Napoleon the, the, the third, uh, his son or daughter, I think, um, was sick and he brought and he didn't believe he wanted to close the, the shrine completely. And then uh, the the child got, got healed. So he changed his mind completely on this. So yes, while uh, while think while the the acclaimed the claimed uh, or actually the actual miracles are happening the church observes observes and 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 uh, withholds judgments so I, until the until the church has not spoken i don't see the problem with with that you know i mean there has to be there has to be a certain prudential judgment of course um uh, but, it's kind of complicated because it, the church needs their time to reflect on to reflect on the, on the given apparitions. I mean, there are apparitions. There's one here in Rome, in Civita Civita Vecchia, uh, where the po the bishop was initially very opposed to it, but then he put the statue in his in his um, 
in his closet or something and it started having it started bleeding or something and started and then he's, he changed his mind, you know, and and the Pope himself was involved in it. And I don't know exactly the status of this revelation right now. But one of the things also that you see um, that why well, I, I did study it a little bit uh, and I and I met the people there. I went to see it. And, and what I noticed is that the people that are involved in it are very normal, ordinary people. That's a key sign. So we also do have to look as the church is analyzing these situations they they basically look at what kind of people are involved in it you know um are they are they try are they you know are they just normal people with a job or whatever simple people usually it's simple people why because god does that that's the kind of the approach that god uses you know and they not kind of it is the approach that god uses to show that it's from him and not from the person so when you you know um at the same time, also you have to look at if it's is from God or if the or the evil one. So there's also that. So the church needs her time to analyze and to and to see, you know, to 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 take into consideration, um, to observe. It takes time, but in the meantime, yeah, I think that people uh, can approach these uh, these sites, uh, but with caution, I would say, you know, and and that's what's happening, for example, with Magigori. I think. It's ongoing. Magigori is there's it hasn't really closed yet. Uh, they've they've had a number of different uh, commissions from Rome. With the most recent one with Cardinal Arini, and even Cardinal Ratzinger went there before he became Pope. He went to see, and there's sort of a suspension of judgment on the situation because even there it's, um, and there there's a big history. Uh, uh, for instance, the the actual place in Magigori. There were these Franciscans go back in that go back to the 1700s with some problems that they had with in terms of disobedience with Rome. So uh, that's that's part of the problem there. Um, but then you have to wonder why why this phenomenon, why Medjugorje, for instance, why why in the 1980s all of a sudden all these apparitions happened there, and it's a time also when it looks at that, it's also a time of. Of confusion in the church in the 1970s the church 60s and 70s the church witnessed a, a great confusion and so these the human heart has a need for something above something more supernatural so something that wasn't happening and there wasn't um, a lot of marian devotion taking place in the parishes anymore uh for instance and so people needed this you know they needed to go to these they needed to believe in something like this um it's interesting also to look at that historically. Historically, why why Medjugorje? You know, uh, here there's uh, Radio Maria in Italy. Uh, Padre Livio, the the founder, of the, the one who's in charge of it, he's big proponent of it. At the same time, the bishops are very they don't know what to say. So it's one of these things where it's like, what what's going on? You know, and the, the Vatican itself has not spoken on this. Um, and so it's one of these phenomena. It's a forty-year. It's now over forty years. This phenomenon, this situation, and uh, we don't have clarity. And there's a lot of debates going on among theologians about it. There's a lot of people. There are a lot of theologians I know who are disagreeing with it, who, who don't see the value, who, who see some inconsistencies with it. Uh, for instance, the fact that Our Lady appears so much. It's not typical to other to other times. Um, if I'm not mistaken, though, the Vatican did approve of parish is doing pilgrimages there even though it hasn't given its full stamp of approval exactly things like that are happening so it's just it's kind of confusing you know and and but now there's more and more of these apparitions coming up all over the place and and uh, and and people in the vatican is working on it there are mariologists who go over and see and, and see these sites uh, but i guess the question to be asked the big question to be asked is why is this happening so much why why are there so many apparitions um and what are we to do what and i think it's a i think it has to do with authority as well the authority of the church and this and and um and there's a question of that in, in many people's minds and souls today and and um what to do in a situation like this you know well i think that's where we do have to to take seriously the authority of the church and and um 
and and the church needs to take it take it seriously and demonstrate uh, um, that that she takes the t- takes these things into consideration. I mean, there was a situation recently here near near um, near Rome as well. And, uh, I forget the place now. It's uh, what it's called again. But I looked at it. I, I looked. I also followed this case and looked at it. And I understand why the church in that situation is not speaking because in that situation the church the bishop is being prudent because he's saying well if I speak in the situation it's only going to create more curiosity so really in terms of the church's role in this the church's authority she has to to practice prudence in her judgments uh, and, and honestly in this in this one situation I I, I it was almost embarrassing to see. Um, this TV um, production on it, it really, they, you could see that they were making fun of, of the faith. And that was really a shame to see it depicted as such, uh, because there was the, the quote unquote seer, she was involved with lots of money. And also, usually when there's that involvement, then you know that there's something awry, uh, when people are making a lot of money off of it. Um, and so that's and 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 the church, I guess, the bishop there decided he preferred not to speak, so as not to put more fuel on the fire, you know. And, and I don't know. It's it's not it's a it's a not an easy question. Your question: How do people get involved? This is why I say in such situations, it's better to trust what the church has already approved, and follow that. And these are. I mean, to kind of keep a distance in a sense, I think, you know, kind of look at it and keep, like sort of like what I'm doing right now with Medjugorje. I, I look at it, I, I I have a respectful distance from it um, because I don't want to insult the people that are faithfully going there because there's a lot of, that's also something to be also pastorally to take into consideration as a priest. I don't want to say something that's totally offensive to people because if they go there and they have this experience and they and and they start having a conversion, because of it, well, then I must take something into consideration. So uh, my role, I guess I'll conclude with this, is really, the, I just use the word conversion. And conversion is in Latin, we in uh, we use the word metanoia in, in Greek. It's from the Greek, the change of mentality. What is a conversion? What is a real conversion? And, and, it, and we understand in theology that a conversion is something that takes time it's not a fundamental option and jp2 talks about this in veritati splendor it's not something that just takes place you have this conversion and it's one one day i met jesus that's it i met our lady that's it finished and then you can do whatever you want no a real conversion is something where it's tested in time with 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 uh with temptations with different struggles so when people go to to Medjugorje and they come back as Alistair McIntyre says, we live in the epoch of emotivism. So they come back full of emotion. What's a pastor supposed to do in a situation like that? Well, accept the good that's there and see and test it. Test the spirit. See that that it that 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 this is a real conversion. See that this person is really willing to 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 change in their ways, and that they really have a change of mentality, metanoia, and that they really want to love our Lord in everything they do to the end of time, to the end of their lives, then, then there's, a, then there's something there. And then that's, that's where the pastoral role comes in for us. It's like to, to, um, to encourage, you know, and w- what we see in Magigori, for instance, is people going to confession, people doing more, there's very, it's very Christocentric, a lot of confessions, a lot of adoration of our Lord in the sacraments. Okay. Bring that to the to your churches. Bring that to your to your um, parishes. Bring that mentality of praying the rosary, of adoration, of frequent confession, of reception of the Eucharist. If that's happening in the parishes, God bless you. Then that, that's that's a good thing. Yes, I, I got from First uh, Thessalonians as you were speaking. I mean, it reminds of this verse here from First Thessalonians. Um, do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to that which is good. Reject every kind of evil. Um, Jean, tell us, um, with regard to uh, the already approved apparitions, particularly Fatima, as you said, it, it's directed at the whole wide world. What is the severity, the, the need to engage in this right now? It's huge. And... 
all the confusion, it can be cleared up pretty simply. There's basically three classes that we need to look at. There's unapproved private revelation. We got to just throw, we got to just set that aside because that'll just confuse everyone, right? We should hold out until the church gives the final approval. So what we're speaking about, when we talk about private revelation. We always mean approved private revelation. Now, when we're in that category, there's only two, there's only two classes there. Those messages that are directed at you and those messages that are not directed at you. Almost none of the private revelations are have, have an extra step on top of living a normal Catholic life of holiness. Almost none of those messages have something that you were specifically required to do. Fatima actually gives you specific steps to take on top of living the normal life of holiness and being Catholic. And that's, well, like we said before, the Blue Army Pledge of uh, first Saturday devotion, wearing your brown scapular as a sign of your consecration, offer up, bring, offering up your sufferings and daily duties, and praying the rosary every day. That was that was written by Sister Lucia herself, and immediately the Bishop of Fatima said, promulgate this is coming from me. This is light years different than Medjugorje or any of these non-approved private rev revelations. So we, we don't want the listeners to get it twisted. Th this is approved private revelation that's directed at you. And the Fifth Lateran Council back in 1516 actually talks about that. It says, and, and this is the quote from the Fifth Lateran Council, if the Lord reveals to certain of them by some inspiration, some future events in the church of God, as he promises by the prophet Amos, and as the apostle Paul, the chief preacher says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophesying, for we have no wish for them to be counted with the other group of storytellers and liars or to be otherwise hindered. So that's speaking directly there, what we said about unapproved private revelation. And then the quote goes on to say, for as Ambrose bears witness, the grace of the spirit himself is being extinguished. If fervor in those beginning to speak is quieted by contradiction, in that case, a wrong is certainly done to the Holy Spirit. That is, that is extremely powerful. And like we said, apocalyptic I can't even stress the importance of this because everything that we see, the problems of the world, abortion, problems in the liturgy, problems with doctrine, it is all symptomatic of us not doing what Our Lady of Fatima says. So we have to make this as clear as possible for people, cut through all the garbage of non-approved private revelation and say, no, this is, Fatima is in a let me, let me Let me stop you there. Um, you can't say that. Because you can't call garbage all non-approved. Because as we said in the beginning, Fatima was unapproved when all they went there. And if so, we tell them that was all garbage, don't go. You'd be saying, don't go to Fatima. You'd be saying, don't go to Fatima when the miracle of the sun is happening. Don't go to Lourdes when the miracles are happening. So it's not that they're garbage. It's that it's a different category. And that we can totally agree on. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Just as long as we have those categories proper, that, then it makes sense. I just didn't want anyone to get confused that we, we want to know that when something actually is approved, we really have to dial in and, and you know, put on our thinking caps and do those Absolutely. steps. In, in one category, the category of unapproved, we can go there. We can look at it. We can, as Father said, look at the fruits, look at the people who are saying that they're receiving private revelation? Are they are they normal Catholics? Are they just faithful Catholics uh, not making a mint of money off it? Are they, are they, you know, living holy lives or trying to? That's all a matter of discernment. We take that with a, with a grain of salt, if you will, of discernment. Once they're approved, there's no longer a question of, hmm, I got to look at this and think what it... No, we're required to do what Our, what our Lady of Fatima... Uh, said that we need to do, and if we don't do that, we do that. We we leave that out to our peril, the peril of the church, uh, and our own spiritual lives as well. Father, we'll leave last take on to you. Oh, <laughs> well, no. There's um, there's really a lot to be said about the the, uh, the message of Fatima, and the, even you can talk about the whole consecration of Russia and all that, and. So, but I, I would not want to really get into all that right now. Um, but, but we do see. But I know I don't want to get into that. There's, a, there's a lot to be said on that point, on that that point about the consecration of Russia. Um, Gene, might you, might you think to address that because that that is a huge issue with regard to Fatima, and um, 
it 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 remains like they were, Our Lady was super specific on it needs to be done. And when the popes, different popes, tried to do it, um, initially even mentioning Russia, but not done with all the bishops, it was always nope, not good enough. Nope, not good enough. And so, I don't know if you want to speak to that, Gene, but where are we at on that score? And is there something lacking still there? Yeah, I, I, I try to focus on what's going to unite everyone back to the whole, you know, the, the unite the clans. And we all know that when, regardless of whether the consecration of Russia was done properly, we know that when enough Catholics do what Our Lady of Fatima asked to do, those, those steps of that Blue Army Pledge, then we'll see the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So if that means the consecration wasn't done and enough Catholics do the, the, the um, Blue Army Pledge, then the Pope will get the grace to properly consecrate Russia. Or if Russia was already consecrated and still we're still missing the triumph of Mary, so clearly not enough Catholics have lived that Blue Army Pledge. Either way, it doesn't change our marching order. So what I like to do to try to be more, you know, so every obviously bring everyone together, unite the clans, and that would be make sure all of us do our part. And then we pray for the Pope and the bishops to do to do their part. And when enough people live the Fatima message, then we'll get the triumph. We know we haven't seen the triumph. That everyone can agree on. So let's let's do our part in contributing to that. Let's let's while people are thinking about this, what are the requirements? Because I I'm sure a lot of people right now are thinking, wait a minute, what are the requirements? Tell us those, please. Yes. So number one, it's offer up your daily duties and sufferings according to your state of life. Wear the brown scapular as a sign of our consecration. Pray the rosary every day and the first Saturday devotion. So uh, receiving communion on the first Saturday, going to going to confession, uh, meditating for 15 minutes on one or more of the mysteries of, of the rosary. Um, what, what did I miss there? The communion, penance, Eucharist, rosary, and meditation. The rosary, which you're doing every day anyway. And then, and the confession is within eight days of uh, the whole first Saturday, first Saturday of the month. Yes, and so when when enough people do this, that's when we'll finally see the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So we can be sure not enough people are are taking that action, and this is this is basically the key that unlocks the door. And there's no other way. There's no other solution. When Sister Lucia. Um, wrote that pledge back in 1946, the Bishop of Fatima immediately said, promulgate this is coming from me. So it's, you know, couldn't it be more clear let's, marching orders. <laughs> let's unpack that a little bit. The, the grace that's needed from heaven to bring about the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, this amazing period that we're waiting for in human history, where Mary's Immaculate Heart will triumph over the forces of evil for a time, but nonetheless, in a way that heaven's never had it triumphed on earth before, um, is promised to us and waiting for enough of us to do what was to be done. And yes, you, as you said, Jane, in your, in your uh, address, that basically you have to do what it's addressed to you. So the laity don't have to worry so much <clears throat> about the part of her message addressed to the Holy Father, to the Pope. Um, that has to be done by them. But even in that, their grace to do that comes from the laity fulfilling their part of the deal, which is this scapular, uh, the, the, the first five first Saturdays. And it is, you know, pretty simple. But a lot of people, I've found anyway, even the daily masters who are going to mass every day, so they're fulfilling the uh, first Saturday devotion all by itself. People, often those people are going to mass once every two weeks, which by the way, will get you a plenary indulgence all the time because then you're always within eight days uh, on either side of, uh, of um, that necessity. But one of the things they skip because most of those guys say the daily rosary anyway, but what's often overlooked is that 15 minutes of meditation apart from the rosary, it's not a two for one. You can't go, yeah, I, I prayed the rosary for 15 minutes. And so that counts for both. No, um, it is about meditation apart from the saying of the rosary on the mysteries of the rosary. Um, in fact, a couple of years ago, I found that was so undone by people, even when they wanted to, um, that I looked for a meditation, couldn't find one. So I did one myself. So we put that out on LifeSite every first Saturday. Um, and so hopefully that's of help to people so that they can engage in this meditation. Follow your take. 
Uh, I, I'm sorry, could I intervene right now? Yeah, please. Oh, good, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I, I'm glad about the last point you just made um, is important because this is what, what you see with the great spiritual masters like St. Teresa of Avila, who emphasized that uh, this with her sisters, this is what she was seeing as a problem, that they were just praying the vocal prayers. And so in their interior castle, she talks about this. You know, the, the vocal prayers are the first prayers. They're important, but it's like kind of like it's like the, the the meat and potatoes that are there always for every meal, that there's bread at every meal, let's say. And uh, but then there's got to be more. And that's the meditation. That's the reflection. And another point that I wanted to make comes from uh, St. Teresa's Little Way, St. Teresa of Lisieux's Little Way. And I'm going to use a citation from St. Thomas Aquinas first. Actus credendi non terminator ad enunciabile sed ad rem. The act of belief does not terminate in what is announced, but in the rest, in the thing. So the way the, 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 the saints teach us so much about the rest, the thing, the, the, the heart of the matter is in the sanctity of the, of the moment and of the thing, of the little way, essentially. You know, oftentimes people think, well, the little way, it sounds so banal. No, because living intensely, the presence of God in your life, living intensely, the rosary, living intensely with contemplation, everything that is asked, that's very simple, but you live it with intensity, with love, because you have to have love. You have to have a conversion of heart. You're not going to be going to heaven just for the what you know. The demons know a lot, and they don't have, the, but they don't have love. They don't have the will is not there. St. Francis of Sales once asked, um, was once asked, is is it enough? How am I to love God? He said, Do you want to love him? And the, the person said, Yes. Then that's the beginning, because then the grace of God can come in. The grace, which is the qualitative entity that comes in and comes in and, and changes you, forms you, transforms you, that comes into the to the heart of each moment of your life. And if we learn to live life like that, you know, if we live life so that we see, you know, that we we see how every moment of our life uh, is a moment of conversion, is a moment of change, is a, and we see that there's a constant conversation with God also. There's a constant conversation with God. I also like, John Henry, what you said um, about, you know, how you offer, like you offer your day, you offer the, the 15 minutes after a communion when you've received the Eucharist. Those are very important moments, the beginning of the day, the end of the day, when you receive in preparation for mass and when you receive communion, when you've got Jesus within you, that concreteness is so important because it's getting used to that. That's going to, that's going to have a lot of meaning later on because we have to prepare ourselves just like the, the, the prudent virgins in Matthew 25, we have to prepare ourselves for when our bride comes, for, excuse me, for when the groom comes, the bride needs to prepare for when the groom comes you know, and, um, and and that takes preserving preserving those oils, which is the oils of grace that God has there, there for us. Spending our life doing that, because so much of of what of our salvation depends on how we die, and so you want to prepare yourself for that moment. Um, and and you, you can't just you know you can't just expect uh, to be ready, you know, uh, without given. Uh, preparation without the love that's there and and asking like you know saint joseph help with the holy death and all that all of these things all of these uh all the teachings of the saints all the teachings of theology all the teachings of spiritual theology at that have to serve at the Salus Animarum, for the Salus Animarum, for the salvation of souls and of concrete souls because in the end of the day it's a, it's your salvation that's at stake, your individual salvation that you have come to by yourself, of course, but also with the help of of, of those around you. You know, um, there was a passage in Luke chapter four, I believe, um, where it was just a recent passage in the liturgy, uh, where Jesus um, the. the the people of Nazareth were asking him to make a miracle. He said, no, I'm not going to make a miracle. And he talks about uh, the, uh, the, the the miracle of the Syrian and, and the 
Amen, I think it was Amen in the in the, in the in the river Jordan that he comes in the Syrian with the leprosy, and he says that he says that that person came in with faith. That and or also the woman with a hemorrhage that touches him, she feels you know that's the beginning in the, in the Catholic the Catholic Church, the the edition from 1990. You see that the passage in the sacraments begins with this the the, the uh, an image of the hemorrhage the woman with the hemorrhage touching jesus she doesn't touch him like everyone else touches him she touches him with faith she touches him with intention so the object the intention and the circumstances come into the moral act and what is the intention with which you begin your day what is the intention with which you do each little thing and then will our lord jesus christ come into contact with you and that's that's the importance of the sacraments, the contact with Christ, and and that's what all of this ends up leading us to. And uh, if Our Lady has said that to, for greater contact with Christ, you need to do uh, those precepts, do them, do them with that same love, though, with that same intensity, with that same intention, and and that's the that's the little way. And another, one last note on this: the little way, our, when Saint Teresa developed this in her own life and she was not a pushover uh, easygoing kind of person she was very choleric actually so a, 50, a 15 year old that goes to the to see the pope in order to get permission to get into the carmel is not a pushover so she was a very tough girl and um and and so we have to listen to what she says to and she was having trouble because the jansenist in the jansenist france um the the it was also always talking about hell 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 which is great it's great though for those that are, you know, that are that are having a that are having that are taking it easy that have too much acedia, you know, that 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 are don't don't have a very int intense spiritual life. But for someone as scrupulous as she, or someone as scrupulous as Saint Ignatius of Loyola, you need to have something to encourage you. You can't be constantly be battered over with hell, 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 hell. And um, and I had an experience like this reading her last week. I'd read I, I'd read her after reading the dreams of Saint John Bosco uh, to the to the to about his the, the boys going to hell, and I was like, oh, I was just feeling down because I was thinking, my gosh, it's so easy to go to hell, and it is. I mean, it's so easy to go to hell, it's so easy to go to purgatory uh, very quickly. Uh, going going to heaven is not easy, and you know, reading Saint Pio Petrucina and. San uh, Nicola Tolentino. I mean, all the saints in Italy. There's so many of these saints that bring really bring out how hard it is to go to heaven, you know. And that for us priests, you know, it's really it's heavy for us. So I was kind of like a little bit overwhelmed last week as a priest, thinking, "My gosh, I've got so many souls. I've got to everything I say, everything I, I got to be careful." And then this this really hit me, you know, and it made sense theologically, you know. Um, because it made sense that it's on the concrete. So if I can do a lot, if I can make of the little, if I can make of what is natural, supernatural, if I can make of what is ordinary, extraordinary, if I can be artistic about my faith in a sense, to be creative with it, all the better, all the better. And it gives me a lot of hope, you know? And so um, St. Thomas Aquinas on this, I'll conclude with this. He says, that uh, sometimes there's something positive about anger, and he says it's positive when you're when it's justified, obviously, you know? when it's justified, when it's uh, when it's quick, when it's uh, proportionate. And unlike the anger of the devil to our Lord, which is not justified, which is not quick, and which is not proportionate, as you see in the, in the, the passion. But this is also there because it's there to give us hope, because if you have if you have you are if you're going to fight for something something concrete something reachable then you have hope and so in the spiritual life we must have hope we must use our 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 strength for that father thank you for that gene last word over to you yeah just you know with all the confusion all the crisis in the world in the church this is this is our one answer this is that this is the only answer that that heaven willed to give us so it's not like we're making it up on our own and that is the Blue Army Pledge. It's been the answer since the time of Our Lady of Fatima. So make sure we're enrolled in the brown scapular, wear the brown scapular as the sign of our consecration, pray the rosary, um, offer up our sufferings and daily duties, 
and the first Saturday devotion and make it as frequently as possible and then get as many people to do it. When when an unknown number, a, a specific number that's predetermined by heaven does this, then we'll get the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So more than anything else, now Catholics need a clear direction, a firm purpose, and a means of achieving that purpose. And that's what the message of Fatima is all about. And that's how we're going to save the world. Amen. Well, you've got your marching orders. Thank you so much, Gene. Thank you, Father Giordano, for being with us. Thank you. And God bless you all. And we'll see you next time.